MP gives funding to fast track clash probe. As Taripori MP says more police needed on the ground. And Minister says agriculture is everyone's business. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me with Sunday's news. Higher Education Minister Pila Neningi has committed 20,000 kina to investigate the cause of fight at Yalibu Secondary School. A grade 11 student from Imbongu electorate was killed during the fight last Tuesday. The fight has stopped but tension is still high. Police are yet to file a complete report of the Yalibu Secondary School fight, which started last Tuesday evening. A grade 11 boy was killed by another warring group, while two other students were seriously injured and are fighting for their lives at the hospital. Four dormitories and an ablution block were set alight. Dust Minister Pila Niningi visited the school yesterday and committed 20,000 kina to police to fast track investigation and arrest those involved. We said, man, we said, one inside will stop long and all gonna must arrest now. Police must go inside, move in area and arrest him all. Yalibu Secondary School is one of the oldest in the country. It opened in 1974, a year before PNG got its independence. It produces some of PNG's politicians like Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, Dust Minister Pila Niningi, and the PNG Defense Force Commander, Brigadier General Gilbert Toropo. Police say the fight started from a dispute over the school principal position. Uh, this is where the problem started also, from there and then I will work. Just put in my main problem and the resources together. I'm also having some problem with the resources, but I'm already on top of things, so I'm on the ground now. Police are currently providing security at the school to ensure good order in the school and community. Minister Niningi also told his people to change their mentality and allow services to flow. He warned them that if they continue to fight, then the constructing of Western Pacific University in Yalebu may be delayed. I'm inside the electorate, I'm me, 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 no one bell on this lab, passing all work in Lomen. All teachers too, he got passing long. Senesim all teachers now. He got passing on Bianen. Suppose all teachers all on Bianen passing. All two arrested too. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Trade and Commerce Minister Wera Mori says the government alone cannot rebuild the country's economy. Minister Mori urged stakeholders in the agriculture sector to open up to dialogue focused on improving the national economic environment. He says agriculture is the only sector in which ordinary people can directly influence. The national government launched its economic recovery plan late last year. Among its priorities was to revamp the declining economy. Various goals were highlighted as key instruments to stimulate the economy. Agriculture was one agenda. The Trade and Commerce Minister says the sector needs active participation by stakeholders. I will be discussing, I'll be presenting a paper in NEC to make sure that we are able to provide a conducive environment for those from the agricultural sector who need support. Agriculture has played a significant role in supporting the country's economy since independence. But in the past 10 years, it has performed way below expectations. Experts say there are many contributing factors to this. Minister Morris says active participation by all levels of government and sectors is the only way to improve the sector. It is important that we take, we make these measures now, we take these measures now, so that we can be able to push the agenda, and that is on economic recovery, which is one of the cornerstone of the Alata II Accord. The Trade and Commerce Department will be working closely with the Agriculture Department to drive forward key agendas linking trade and agriculture. So that together we can be able to bring agriculture to the forefront. Jack Lopave, Jr. National MTV News. 
An Ombudsman Commission report presented to the Speaker of Parliament has revealed the unlawful issuance of entry permits and the granting of citizenship to Indonesian man Joko Chandra. Chandra. The report found that relevant laws and regulations were bypassed by the PNG Immigration and Citizenship Service Authority. The report cites the improper and unlawful issuing of a PNG passport by migration officers. The Commission concluded there was the improper issuing of two APEC business travel cards and misapplication of a power by then Minister of Foreign Affairs Anopala. Mr. Chandra was wanted by Indonesian police for a string of offences and corruption charges. Emergency controller Dr. William Hamblin has issued an emergency order for Hela province. Dr. Hamblin urged all security forces to mobilize and take control of the town. The controller also clarified that the relief effort is now impossible to continue given the recent unrest in and around Tari Town. Dr. Hamblin says the PNG Defence Force and police will set up roadblocks to monitor the situation. Taripori MP James Marape says Hela needs the full arm of law and justice to function. Mr. Marape says Hela has only 40 police officers, a figure below the average ratio. He says authorities will be working together to control and monitor the situation. The Taripori MP says additional security forces will be dispatched to Hela. The ongoing clashes are a result of payback killing after a councillor was murdered. Presence of police, let alone, uh, and also the absence of a full uh, arm of the law and justice sector operating up there. Uh, we have national court functioning, but uh, this record uh, sometimes is not complementary to the function of national courts up there. The full uh, entire clockwork of police force is not operational in Ella province, let alone my district. Uh, the Correctional Service Institution hasn't been working in Tari since 1996. Uh, and so uh, those circumstances uh, continues to exacerbate uh, trouble conflicts uh, because there's an absence of formal structure in dealing with problems. And when problems arise, many times people re have been resorting to tribal ways of dealing with uh, conflicts. Yo, at Sunday's news, we'll have more of the day's stories after this message. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Segayo Village in Bulolo District launched the government's rural electrification program on Friday. Bulolo MP and Minister for Communication, Information and Energy Sembasil held hands with NEA Secretary Vore Veve to launch the program. Cabinet endorsed the National Energy Policy 2018 to 2028 in February. Moving on, member for Samari Mura District, E.C. Henry Leonard, presented a check of 82,000 kina to International Training Institute for 17 students from his electorate. He says investing in human development in his electorate is one sector that has been missing. MP Leonard wants to create professionals to build and develop human assets in his electorate. With limited professionals in his electorate, member for Samurai Murua, Isi Henry, emphasized that human development is one major sector that is currently lacking. He says while it is difficult for parents and guardians to give students the opportunity to further their education, providing such initiatives will only go into developing the human resource sector and providing not only employment opportunities, but also to create educated professionals in different sectors. Because right now, that's the major challenge. We don't have the required and the necessary human resource to develop our uh, electorate. We have very limited teachers, very limited community health workers, even the trade personnel, and other professionals like doctors, lawyers, accountants. We need them. Right now, we need them. And within my electorate, we are looking at developing uh, woodluck mines. We need trade personnel. We need accountants, we need doctors. We will also be develop, uh, developing again visual minds. We need people, experienced and knowledgeable people. We will also be developing our uh, Sudest uh, Login Project. 
We need human resource. Right now we don't have that. He says while there are big plans for the development in his electorate, bringing in businesses and employment opportunities is one thing, but people should also be prepared for the change and be part of the change. He says an agreement with students is in place for students to return and work in the electorate. We will sponsor them and they have to sign an agreement with us that we pay them all 100% fees, that they must make an agreement with us that after completing the training, they must come and serve at least part of the time within the electorate. Whether they be a trade personnel, whether they be health workers, doctors, whatever profession that they acquire, having graduated, given the uh, skills and knowledge, I want them to return back and give some time within the electorate <coughs> to serve our people. I believe that it's only fair and just for them to return something back to the people. And after having served their term within the electorate, they can then go out and pursue and further their careers. Those, in, uh, education is something you can't take away from a person. Once they're educated, they have that knowledge. Resources, it depletes, but not human resource. And that's where we are, to assist and uh, in uh, providing those services wherever we can. And ultimately, we are the one of the few institutes which brings the education to the doorsteps. And that's our long-term plan. While the education budget stands at 1 million kina, more than six education institutions in the country have taken students from the Samurai Murua district, supported by the provincial government. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. 45 students from the University of Papua New Guinea spent the Easter weekend learning about how to share the love of Christ to everyone they meet. These training programs were hosted by Student Life, the University Ministry of Great Commission Movements, PNG. PNG GCM Director Daniel Mills said the training is not only to have people witness, but also to be movement builders through discipleship to make an impact everywhere they go. Easter is a time to remember what Christ did for mankind more than 2,000 years ago on Calvary by dying for our sins to bring everyone the choice of eternal life. 45 UPNG students selflessly gave up three days of catch-up study time to attend the Student Life Easter Conference to get training on how to share the love of Christ with individuals. So we are looking to equip these uh, university students to, to make a big impact for Christ here in our university campus, at the uh, UPNZ, and to the rest of the nation as a whole. For Rosalind Erehe and Levi Aki, it was their first time to experience such an event. They both found it extremely fulfilling to approach individuals and share the gospel. Interview, interview uh, him, he told me that uh, I am a rascal man. Uh, I need to hear this uh, word of God so that it can change my life. One would expect everyone to be open to the gospel since this is a Christian country. But the response that she got was quite the opposite. However, it only made her more determined to bear witness to more people. You know, putting in what we learned from the training, you have to, it's your initiative, you have to push hard to get the message out there. It's Easter and it's all about Jesus Christ. And after going through, this booklet, we did succeed in what we were trying to, you know. Great Commission Movement's PNG director, Daniel Mills, said, this conference not only trains individuals to share the gospel, but also gives participants the chance to learn about discipleship and making an impact everywhere they go through movement building. Teach, they disciple people in the church or wherever they are, and teach them how to disciple others and how to teach others how to disciple others. So when they leave, if they're with a, with a job, they get transferred, then the people th where they leave are still doing that, still training disciples, and it will be continuing to grow where they go. The Student Life Movement is an interdenominational organization aimed at reaching tomorrow's leaders today through evangelism to make an impact in society. Lillian Sopera Kinea, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. When we come back, we'll take a look at stories making headlines overseas. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, the United Nations is calling for an independent inquiry into the deadly violence on the Gaza border. Fifteen Palestinians died yesterday on the first day of six weeks of planned protests. Thousands of Palestinians came out to bury the 15 shot dead yesterday, furious at the use of Israeli snipers against what they insisted were unarmed protesters, at worst throwing stones or burning tires. The protest at the border continued, as it will until the middle of May. Nobody has been killed so far today, but 60 Palestinians have been injured. We have organized social and sporting activities to distract the youth from confronting the occupation soldiers. But as you see, the soldiers keep provoking them into violence. That country denies the rules of international humanitarian law. But we will continue until we achieve our goals. Yesterday's demonstrations were the start of six weeks of protest, demanding the right of Palestinians to return to the land they lost when modern Israel was formed almost 70 years ago. The Israeli Defense Force used tear gas, delivered by drones, and then rubber bullets against the crowd. Finally, a reported 100 snipers used live rounds, they say, to defend their border. Israel claims the protest was used by Hamas as a cover for terrorist attacks, but once again it is accused by many British politicians of a civilian massacre, of using disproportionate violence. Israel claims it only killed militants, releasing this video showing two armed men approaching the border fence. Both were killed. What we've seen is a violent riot in its clearest form. The Hamas terrorist organization have sent their people here to camouflage their true intentions. And we've seen that on the ground, just behind where I'm standing right now. Hamas released its own video, showing a young man running away from the border holding a tire. He is shot dead moments later. Too distressing to show on television at this time, but this video and several others like it are being viewed millions of times on the internet. That will fuel Palestinian anger as Israel approaches its 70th anniversary next month and the US embassy moves to the disputed city of Jerusalem. Kenya's tourism minister is calling for anyone caught with ivory to be sentenced to life in prison. He spoke out at a memorial service for the world's last male northern white rhino, which was put down last month due to ill health. Poachers have targeted white rhinos because their horns are more valuable per kilo than gold. Very clear. As government, punitive measures must be taken into punishing people who kill our wildlife. Kenya's rhino population has plunged from 20,000 in the 1970s to just 650 today. Getting through to inmates who are addicted to pee is a major challenge for corrections. This week, a confronting one-man play was performed at the Christchurch Men's Prison in New Zealand by an actor who's seen firsthand the damage caused by meth. A room full of prisoners. Meth becomes Tim's drug of choice. Telling these recovering addicts about his big brother's descent into chaos. The way Tim treats meth, he treats it like it's a little baby. That's the way I, I, I think he treats it. He loves it. He loves it very, very much. His brother's been jailed three times, initially after the meth lab in his bathroom exploded. It's the first time the Australian actor has been allowed to perform behind bars. It was very intimidating at the start, and I was, I was very, I've been very nervous all morning. Um, but because this is something that I've always wanted to do, um, I think like halfway through I, I settled down and it, it became, I realised that these guys are very similar to my brother and, and it was much easier. They laughed with him. <laughs> they applauded. They could relate. Myth kind of ruined me in all different ways. I went this inmate jailed for dealing meth brought to tears. Was it hard for you to hear how tough his brother's addiction was on his family? Um, definitely, because I, um, it's something I haven't thought about and it's something that I realise now how difficult it is on a family, to me, more than us. 
The play's been brought into the drug treatment unit by Odyssey House, an external provider that runs a six-month addiction course behind the wire. I think it's good just to give them different mediums of, of ways of, of looking at the effects of their drug use on the community and on family members. So take whichever moral you would like from this show. Thank you very much, guys. It's been really lovely to do this for you. Thanks. The way we've got the opportunity to bring someone into the prison like John, then um, I think it's, it's great for the men. The aim to stop inmates like this... For me, has to come to an end. ...from ever coming back to jail. Lisa. Don't go away. We have True Kai Sports coming up next with Rugby Sevens, Charity Soccer and the 43rd Softball title. Stick around for details. True Kai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The Mantas are the cup champions of the 2018 Sports Talk, Port Moresby Easter Rugby Sevens Tournament. In a nail-biting finals encounter, the Mantas finished strong over the Central Coast, claiming the top prize of 5,000 Kina, while two development teams of the PNG Puk Puks finished with the ball and play trophies. The two-day tournament ended yesterday evening after the Mentas ran in four tries to defeat the Central Coast 29-14. It was an uneven matchup as the Mentas had younger players with little sevens experience as compared to the Central Coast opponents. However, at full time it came down to speed as the younger Mentas side capitalized on outrunning their older opponents. Earlier matches saw teams compete for sports in the finals. Even players who hung their rugby boots years ago came out to take part. In the other final playoffs, the PNG Rugby Sevens Academy team pulled off an easy win over the Juggernauts 28-0 to claim the bowl trophy and a 1,500 Kina prize money while the PNG Puk Puk's development squad held off a determined Black Orchids 19 points to 7 to win the play trophy and a prize of 2,500 kina. Tournament organizers and sponsors were commended for their efforts in supporting the code. You know, rugby is an Olympic sport now and it is everyone's dream to play at the Olympics. And if we can all work together and you know, work with uh, sponsors like Sports Talk and others to come in and give that, continue to give that support to the younger players come in that they play for something. Congratulations to the winners, congratulations to the runners up as well. And uh, we, we wish everyone uh, a, a blessed uh, Easter as well. Stanley Over Junior National, MTV Sports. The Corporate Charity Cup Soccer Tournament continued today with many teams making it into the knockouts early. The annual tournament which kick-started yesterday saw 105 teams from 51 organizations in Port Moresby uniting in the spirit of sports this Easter. Chairman of the Charity Cup, Sione Kami Jr. says this year's event is more family-oriented as they have included the children to take part in the competition as well. Tournament ends on Monday and knockouts will be played tomorrow afternoon for the finals to take place on Monday. Char the Charity Trust, what it does is it, it uh, raises awareness for health and lifestyle diseases. Um, mainly targeting the people in the workforce, the participants of the tournament. So this is a good way to bring out the people from the offices, get them running around, doing some bit of exercise. At the same time too, we also have the women, National, uh, PNG Women Doctors Association here doing some talks, giving out three health checks to all the participants. Try to make it more of a family orientated event. As you can see from looking around, you can see families in their tents all set up within their own corporate houses. Um, we have our junior division, which means all the kids get to come along and play. In previous years, uh, there wasn't any junior division or master's division. So we decided to introduce those two divisions to make it, uh, make it so that everyone can play. 
The 43rd National Softball Championships commenced yesterday in Leh. National Softball President Torosoma says one of the key messages they want to bring out in this year's championships is to stop domestic violence. This is the first time after 10 years for the championships to be held in Leh again, with 13 men's and six women's teams competing. Teams from Port Moresby, Rabaul, Kimbia, Wewek and Lea are competing in this year's championships. The 43rd softball title has been brought to Lea again after 10 years and is being supported by the Lea MP John Russell. So the 10,000 kina, even though it is a small amount, it's something to show our, contr our continued support for anything that encourages healthy development of lay, sporting-wise or community-based. PNG Softball President Ralph Tarasomo said one of the key messages being given through the Games is to end domestic violence. We want to drive that as one of our initiatives. Uh, we've started off uh, the last two years and I'm pretty sure that all our local association presidents are aware of our intention that uh, any Men that beats up the wife must not be allowed to play this game. This is softball titles is also a lead up to other softball championships. We are sending our men's team to the Open World Series uh, in Czechoslovakia or in England. And we've got a women's uh, national team to be selected to go to uh, represent us in the national state championships in Brisbane next year. Lay's Metropolitan Commander Anthony Wagambi Jr. was given the honour of pitching off this afternoon, opening the match between Lay's Gold and the defending champions from Port Moresby, the Kakanas. In a fast game this afternoon, Lay was the first to score leading 1-0 at the bottom of the first inning. The Kakanas made a home run in the second inning, making it one all. They made four more runs in the fourth and fifth innings whilst Lay remained on one. By the end of the fifth inning, the defending champions, the Port Moresby Kakanas, beat Lay's gold 5-1. Lucy Kopana, National MTV Sports, Lay. You're watching Chukai Sports. We'll be back with more after this break. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Newly appointed terminal development company ICTSI South Pacific is a major sponsor of PNG Palais Women's Rugby Sevens team with naming rights. The team is to be called PNG ICTSI Palais Women's Rugby Sevens team. Godin Eki reports. Stretching the leg. This funding ensures that PNG ICTSI Palais Women's Sevens team will secure its opportunity to compete in the Blue Ribbon Hong Kong Sevens in early April and the prestigious World Cup Sevens in San Francisco. If a strong performance finish in the Hong Kong event, PNG ICTSI Palais Women's Rugby Sevens team will secure a permanent spot for the World Sevens Circuit Series next year. Coach John Larry says they are thrilled to have ICTSI South Pacific on board. Thanks to their support, the PNG ICTSI Women's Rugby Sevens team can take its place on the international stage. So we are delighted that even though we haven't started in Motokia yet, we have started in Leh, uh, that we are able to come on board. And I saw the opportunity of supporting the Palais uh, and John and his team, uh, who are already doing a tremendous job. And I think uh, just coming on board and giving them the certainty of sponsorship and support for the future will certainly give them a lot more confidence uh, to play with a great deal of vigour uh, for the future. He says in PNG the uptake of women's rugby in schools is growing rapidly and much more needs to be done, however, to build depth and breadth of interest across the country. Uh, so I think it's really in the, uh, the players' hands on what they want to get out of the sponsorship. Certainly as a sponsor, there's not a lot of uh, uh, linkage in terms of if I spend one dollar, how much will I get back? That's not why we go into sports sponsorship. It's about providing the sports a development opportunity uh, for the longer term. Uh, people come on board because the sport is high profile and it's successful. So in terms of making it high profile and success is really in the hands of the players. And if they can achieve both of those, I think attracting more sponsors, which we are not against, uh, would also provide the sport greater uh, money and support to build it further. The strong backing of a global company such as ICTSI will definitely boost the confidence of current and emerging players. The strength and skill of the current national pool is a testament to the determination of the playing group who have developed with limited resources over the years. 
Commenting on the partnership Ted Mutia ICT size South Pacific, Chief Executive Officer said women's rugby is said to be the fastest growing team sport in the world. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Now to boxing, Joseph Parker fought the biggest fight of his life in front of 80,000 fans today. But even he came away wondering if he'd maybe been a bit too cautious. Parker lost on points to the more composed Anthony Joshua. And as the giant muscular Brit heads off toward world domination, the Samoan Kiwi is left wondering how to fashion a comeback. Anthony Joshua had never gone 12 rounds before. He'd never failed to knock out an opponent. You know, we fought good. But like I said, he's just a better man on the day, you know. So he, he deserves to win. But um, disappointed, but we'll be back. You know, it's uh, just got to take it on the chin. Parker's infamous granite chin, which he says AJ didn't hurt. He hurt me off the head, but I think, which is why he got a cut, but not really. Forget the humble shit. I did hurt him a few times. And I bust his eye as well. And did he hurt you at all? No, not at all. No, not at all, actually. But I knew that he could if I made mistakes. Parker was led out by his two uncles. His family surrounded the ring. His mother, Sala, finds it hard to watch, but is, of course, incredibly proud. I spoke to my parents. What did they say to you after the fight? They said, well done. You know, they're proud. They're happy. Joshua sought her out as well. Even I made sure I spoke to Parker's mum before she left and say, you know, pat your son on the back, he's done well, and he'll be back. And that, that goes a long way, so well, I don't want to kill her son in the ring. Joshua spoke to Parker's mum even before speaking to his own. She said she expected a knockout, and she specified when. I don't know if she had a bet on or something, but she messaged me and said, I want it in the second or seventh. <laughs> she did, I was like, all right. Neither side landing the knockout blow. The fight went all 12 rounds to the judge's decision. I can fight. No, more than 12 rounds. My fitness was good, but maybe a bit too cautious. 12 rounds is fine with me, and it's not about, you know, the 100% KO record at all. It's about securing these and, and winning and being victorious. Anthony Joshua is now just one belt off becoming the unified, undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. Which has made a lot of British fans very happy. I love Joshua! Shamefully though, that same chant and boos rang out over the Samoan and New Zealand national anthems. You know, you got boos and stuff like this. It's what the shocking, heck was it? that? Yeah. We weren't disrespectful for the, to them. They were definitely disrespectful to themselves, you know. And maximum respect to Joseph Parker, gracious in defeat, and after 12 rounds, his head still held high. To NRL, the New Zealand Warriors are unbeatable after four rounds of the NRL, taking down one of the Premiership favourites, the Sydney Roosters, 30 points to six. It may be April Fool's Day, but this is no joke. The undefeated Warriors are on top of the NRL ladder, but coach Stephen Kearney is still playing it down. Possibly we, we, we caught them on a bit of an off day. Or perhaps the Roosters underestimated a Warriors outfit minus their million dollar man Sean Johnson. After all, they had lost their last 11 without Johnson and replacement Mason Leno was playing just his 10th NRL game. This is Harris. He's got a wonderful attitude and, um, and uh, you know, I'm really pleased for him. It's his first NRL win. His first NRL try, his first 100% success rate with the boot, seven from seven. But much of the youngsters' success and the team's victory can be attributed to their new orchestral conductor, Blake Green, whose outstanding form already has State of Origin selectors taking notice. Green. If he was Kiwi, I'd be looking at him for a Kiwis. But Green believes it's not just personnel changes, it's a new mindset. It's almost like we've started started the club from scratch, you know, we've, we've had to have a bit of a clean slate and, and start again. That belief epitomised last night in their goal line defence, holding out five penalties in five minutes. You've got to keep applauding the Warriors' defence. Despite holding an 18-6 half-time lead, the Warriors' relentless work rate continued. Their attack calculated and effective. 
and the history books rewritten, 4-0 to start the season, we can finally say the 2018 Warriors are the real deal. On this Easter Sunday, the cricket test in Christchurch, England has the advantage after three days. The Black Caps all out for 278 early in the day today, with the English now looking to pile on a big overall lead. Might be a long way from Cardiff, but Neil Wagner was feeling the punch from the Hagley Oval bounce. Ooh, nasty. Not long in coming, and that was a nasty bounce. Wagner with the ice on his head as the tail started to wag, but James Anderson's Easter treat was the wicket of the danger man, Tim Southey, for 50. Hold in. Once again, Southey giving himself room, looking to hit Anderson straight. However, the valuable runs from the bats of the tail enders continued to flow as they started to erase the deficit at pace. Well, there it is. Goodness me. One. Wagner and Trent Bolt smashing on 39 for the last wicket, leaving New Zealand more than content with 278, given at one stage they were reeling at 36 for 5. High in the air and it is taken, it is taken. And with their handy lead of 30, it gave under pressure opener Alistair Cook some much needed confidence. That is a shot he enjoys, he's looking good, looking positive. Cook reaching double figures for the first time in this series before left arm swingman Trent Bolt found his outside edge. And there's a catch it is, Bolt does it again. Takes the outside edge of Alistair Cook. The early setback wouldn't trigger the usual collapse as Mark Stoneman and James Vince put on over 100. So. Gets it away from four as well. And the fielders weren't helping their bowlers. Stoneman drops twice. Ooh. Oh, down. Him Southey this time. Stoneman eventually out for 60, leaving England in the box seat heading into day four, as they look to put an end to their 12 away tests without a win. And that wraps up Chukai Sports. Up next, the weather details. Chukai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow, in the southern region, a shower or two in Port Moresby, Daru, Kerama, Alotau, and Popandita. In the Momase region, a shower or two in Lei and Wau, and showers in Medang, Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, showers in Lorengau, KVN, Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, brief showers, then morning fog all across the region in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of Hood Point to Samare Island to Sudest and Rossel Islands, including Aitape to Vanimo, northern PNG Indonesian border, Manus and its western group of islands. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru, Kiwai Island, Kerama, Yul Island to Hood Point, Eastern and Western Milne Bay Islands, Samare Island to Cape Vogel, Finchhafen, Long Island to Medang, to Bogia, to Wewak and Aitape, including East New Britain to New Island and Bougainville, seas of 0 0.5 to 1.5 metres. Waters of Finchhafen through Dampier and Bittia Straits, Siasi Island to Long Island, Manus and its western group of islands to West New Britain, seas of 1.5 to 2.5 metres. Waters of Hood Point to Samare Island to Sudest and Russell Islands, Aitape to Vanimo, northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 2.5 to 3 metres.
Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas rough with southeast to northwest winds at 25 to 34 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas slight to moderate with northwest winds at 10 to 20 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas moderate to rather rough with northwest winds at 15 to 25 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas moderate to rather rough with northwest winds at 15 to 25 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's been the news, sports and weather for today, Sunday, the 1st of April. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.